So good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on your time zone. Uh, we are stretched all the way from Europe to the Middle East and Australia. The Tzvi Yavet School of Historical Studies at Tel Aviv University, together with the Dan David Foundation, is happy to welcome you to this very special seminar with Professor Alison Bashford from the University of New South Wales. Um, in, the, in the summer, we invited Professor Bashford to visit Tel Aviv in person. Um, with in, insight, it seemed we were extremely naive. Little did we expect the Delta and the Omicron, but nevertheless, here we are, excited for this opportunity to welcome Professor Bashford, the Dan David 2021 Laureate in the past category, History of Health and Medicine. Professor Bashford is a historian of medicine, science, and the environment in the global context. Her work allows us to reassess the modern world as an integrated phenomenon of men and matter, empires and colonies, West and East, North and South. Even summarizing Professor Bashford's numerous academic accolades results in a very long list. So in a minute, I will post in the chat box links to her biography on the Dan David Prize website and her university page, so we can see the full extent of her achievements. We'd like to thank Professor Bashford for taking the time to speaking with us today. She's devoting a lot of time to us this week. In addition to today's seminar, on Thursday, Professor Bashford will meet a group of doctoral students and early career scholars, so we really, really appreciate it. The title of her work today, the title of her talk today is Reading Modern Hands, History of Palms, Hands, and Modern Genetics. Alison, thank you. And the Zoom floor screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, greetings to everybody. That screen has come up. Yes, excellent. So um, thank you for that kind invitation. Lovely to be here. It would have been just delightful to uh, be in Tel Aviv speaking to you, but at some point, hopefully, and I'm sure that will be the case. Um, uh, thanks for everybody's time. So the, the, the talk that I decided to, to give today is the first talk, actually, that I've given of a, of a new project. Uh, and it's a project that emerged as I think a lot of our work does as historians, out of happenstance, um, happenstance finds in the archives. We all know as historians, you turn over folders and uh, you know there, there's occasionally some interesting material and sometimes you come across um, uh, folios that are a complete surprise. And it's at those moments that I've learned over the years that, that when something is a surprise and you don't understand it, you keep it, you put it aside, and chances are there's, there's, there's much more to those um, small pieces of archival remnants. And that was exactly what happened to me with this, um, to me, quite surprising interest that I now have in the history of palmistry and the history of hands. And it all stemmed from a surprise find in the Julian Huxley papers, which are at Rice University in Texas. Vast numbers of papers there from the Huxley family. Uh, and that's the book that I've actually just finished. What, what came out of an obscure folders in these personal papers of Julian Huxley, the evolutionary biologist, is this series and more of, of, of portrait-like photographs, quite beautiful, of his own hands there on the right of the screen and the hand of his beloved brother, the novelist and essayist Aldous Huxley um, on the left. And they, they, these, these very beautiful photographs were taken when they were middling old, it's not clear entire, uh, entirely when, and it's not initially clear why, and they puzzled me greatly when I first came across them. And as I always tell my students, put that aside and follow up later and see if there's a story behind it. And that's exactly what I've done. And my initial question was why, why did they take such, these, such careful images uh, and really quite beautiful images, I think you'd agree. And there's a whole fo folder of similar hand photographs. Well, there are two answers in short, and I like to think of the answers as one for each brother. 
For Aldous Huxley, the answer was palmistry. And for Julian Huxley, the scientist of this pair, the answer, in fact, was primatology, much harder to understand. In the 1930s, early 1930s in France, um, Aldous Huxley befriended Charlotte Wolf, a Jewish exile from Germany. Um, she was an already trained medical doctor, a psychotherapist, an analyst of hands, as well as minds. And Aldous Huxley helped her publish a first book on what she always called hand reading, not palm reading. Later, later in London, Julian Huxley helped her access apes, primates in uh, the London Zoo in order that she could study their palms and the handprints of these palms she catalogued alongside those of well-known public intellectuals and artists whose hands photographs and, and um, palm prints she also took. Well, insofar as it's been any kind of historical object of inquiry, we might expect palm reading and photographs of hands and palms to be analysed as part of that very well known late 19th century spiritualist culture, a revived vogue for the occult um, that really by the Huxley's and Charlotte Wolfe's lifetime was in its second and even third generation. Um, as it happens in this historical scholarship uh, on that particular late 19th century moment, palmistry itself is barely examined as a practice. The focus remains on mediums, on the idea of co with communication with the dead, the idea of automatic writing and other kinds of seance practices. There's a vast literature on this. But for me, in this context, that's kind of neither here nor there. It doesn't matter, since my argument in this lecture is that it's quite insufficient uh, to understand Charlotte Wolfe's 1920s, 30s, 40s palm reading and hand reading through that spiritualist culture. It's insufficient entirely. Her hand reading entirely exceeded those practices and often she even repudiated them. So what then was palm reading for her? Well, what I've learned is that it's not only for fortune telling palmists that the mind or the self or the will or the soul was laid bare in the hand. In fact, this was the case for all kinds of other experts in um, bodies and minds at this moment. So with and, th and through this particular hand reader, Charlotte Wolfe, this lecture analyzes palm readers and other knowers of hands across what was for me at least a very unlikely spectrum of disciplines that have really strange and strong crossovers linking palmistry and anatomy, linking psychology and evolutionary biology, linking fortune telling and uh, medical genetics. Few of the hand, re uh, the hand experts that I now become very fascinated with uh, traversed all of these domains, but Charlotte Wolfe did. She was a highly curious person, strange even for her own time, her life with hands, is a 20th century journey through really unlikely ways of knowing the mind, the self and primate histories. So this lecture then uh, explores a history of primate hands and palms that in some ways turns out to be a far more literal, technical and in some instances plainly anatomical history, um, far more that than holding a place in histories of spiritualism or of the occult of this period. Well, Charlotte Wolfe's uh, hand reading ended up as anatomy. It ended up as diagnostics. It was used by geneticists and it certainly circled around psychoanalysis. Uh, it was also applied within primatology uh, and these interventions circled back to human diagnosis through the so-called simian line on the hand, 
Um, in fact, about 2% of humans have a transverse line from one side of their palm to the other. Very few humans have that. Most, pri most other primates have that. Um, and this line uh, that for many decades of the 20th century was called the simian line for reasons that will become clear and is now called the trans, usually called the transverse line. It's still read as a sign in neonates that warrants further diagnostic testing. I, I, I think of it as a kind of medical fortune telling from palms. Well, this extraordinary woman, Charlotte Wolf, repudiated hand reading as fortune telling. And for me, that suggests an interesting and maybe overlooked case for all of that historical uh, and sociological assessment of modern disenchantment in Weberian terms. The rationalization of belief, the diminution of magic, apparently, in the late modern period. And we all know of uh, those of us historians who are historians here, we all know that this is much discussed, much critiqued, much tweaked um, field of inquiry. But I don't think it's had its day yet, neither amongst early modern analysts of magic and science, nor amongst late modern historians of mass cultures of various forms. The most common response at the moment amongst modern historians now is to kind of rescue the idea of magic through the 19th and 20th century. So rather than falling into the idea of disenchantment that um, ideas of magic and superstition um, faded away, it's much more common for historians these days to talk about re-enchantment, that there were remnants and, and uh, transformed versions, I suppose, of enchanted magic in late modern um, culture. But I'm not sure at all that this suffices in the case of palm reading, hand reading. As we'll see, it's not just that some readers claimed their expertise to be a kind of a science, they certainly did that, as we'll see. But I think much more interestingly, palm reading and hand reading actually became part of clinical and research endeavors in modern medicine and science. That's the surprise that I've, I'm, I'm trying to work through in this paper and thinking about uh, taking forward um, into uh, further research. So I'll begin this lecture with um, a brief exploration of how quite familiar vernacular chiromancy, uh, palm reading endured into the 19th century um, and was reshaped within some very conventional medical practices. Then I'll turn to the emergence of um, psychological and psychoanalytic uh, disciplines, which is where Charlotte Wolfe first encountered um, hand reading and palm reading. Third, I'll talk uh, about some of the clinical and medical research contexts in which palm lines became part of psychiatric uh, clinical work and research work in the first instance, and then genetic research. And finally, and I'll probably spend most time on this, I'll explore Charlotte Wolfe's really surprising uh, and to me very exciting work in the field of primatology and zoology, this strange history of the simian line. So let's just go back into the 19th century for a moment. Um, vernacular fortune telling in the early modern period is familiar to enough to all of us, I'm sure. Um, firmly part of North Indian practice and through Roma cultures entering Europe. And it, it, it also entered Catholic um, chiromancy in Europe as an art of divination that linked hands and astrology and physiognomy, reading of, of the face. But for the moment, I want to focus on the period a little bit after that, on late modern chiromancy as it began to enter conventional medical and scientific worlds in unexpected ways. And it did so um, uh, via uh, phrenology in the first instance, alongside the reading of lumps and bumps of skulls and the shapes of faces, of faces and noses, one version of late modern chiromancy interpreted the shape of hands and the creases, mounds and papillae of upturned palms as a version of 
phrenology. And this idea was popular enough uh, in 1848 for Chapman and Hall in England to publish this book, The Hand, Phrenologically Considered, anonymously published. And the author explained that if, as, as he, I think it's a male author, were, uh, uh, said was plainly apparent, the form of the hand can show age and sex and race, he said, then it follows that we must appreciate that it's, quote, not less affected by the particular kind of organisation, the mental disposition and the temperament of the individual. A hand could be read phrenolo uh, phrenologically, showing shape and thinness and fatness of fingers, strong and weak muscles, tendons and joints, and relative size of fingers, thumbs and palms. And this particular phrenologist of the hand sought to classify his hands as objects of inquiry, a, a, a kind of in a natural history manner, I would say. And he nominate, nominated four classes of hands in what we will recognize as a kind of a civilizational or semi-racialized system. He called them the elementary hand, the sensitive hand, the motive hand, and the psychical hand. In the elementary hand, for example, he said, quote, the lowest form of hand, the member retains throughout adult life, the character which it presented in infancy. And it striking resembles the hand of those of the monkey tribe, most nearly allied mm. to man in their organization and outward mm -hmm. form, a hard, thick palm being joined to short rudimentary yeah. fingers. And he spoke of transitional types between the sensitive and the motive hand. Um, he, he said that there's kind of a medical geography Very going on here. Too. He said those kinds of hands and, quote, a native of the north, uh, more common in Scotland than England, in England than France and France than in Italy or Spain. And those yielding this kind of hand, he explained, had uh, enterprising characters. Uh, and they produced collectively desirable um, polities. And so there's a kind of a, not just a medical geography, but a kind of a medical politics being read through the hand in this instance. And the author claimed that this kind of, this particular kind of hand that he called the spatulate hand, quote, is essentially Protestant. So late 19th century Anglophone palmists um, announced chiromancy as they practiced it, sometimes as a science, uh, sometimes as a science combined with art or as a language. Um, there were late 19th century palmists who distanced their expertise from the vernacular fortune telling tradition. This was not uncommon to set that to one side. One who did so was um, a woman called uh, Catherine St. Hill, a London palmist who formed a society, the Chirological Society of Great Britain in 1889. And her interventions really do fall squarely into Weberian disenchantment very, very squarely. Um, she aspired to professionalism. She started a school of palmistry. She started a society which didn't just teach, but systematically examined uh, and even sought uh, government regulation for palmistry. So that absolutely classically fits in that idea of um, disenchant disenchantment. Uh, her palmistry had its own journal, The Palmist, and she wrote an introductory textbook, The Grammar of Palmistry. Well, in this tradition, uh, this is the foreword from her book, um, reading palms lent itself to a grammar since it was a practice with a clear set of defined rules. And it involved the capacity to read far more than palmer lines. The trained palmist would perceive uh, the significance of the outline of the hand, including the fingers, short, long, equivalence between left and right hand, hard or soft hands. They would look at nails, they would look at the shape of fingers, would they be pointed or square or spatulate? The thumb uh, keeps on recurring as a specially important feature. The character depends to a very great extent upon it, she wrote. For Catherine St. Hill, 
As for Palmas preceding and succeeding her, uh, the fingers were still named astrologically. Even though she was professionalizing and she would always say turning a palmistry into a science, she nonetheless retained the astrological names of the fingers, the finger of Jupiter, of Saturn, of Apollo, of Mercury. Time was told by the hand along what she continued to call the line of life and the line of head and the line of fate. Um, the lines are to be read not just for their length, but for their depth and their color, for their branches, for stars and crosses, for their direction. The feel of the hand is also relevant in a, in a really highly sensory and tactile practice. Hot, dry skin signaled liability to fever for her. So she's a kind of diagnostician. Hot, damp skin, a tendency to consumption, she said. Cold, damp skin, liability to a liver complaint. A cross on the Mount of Luna means insanity in the family for her. For Palmas, like uh, Catherine St. Hill, it was almost routine to claim this knowledge as scientific. Um, she said, quote, in older writers, the maxims of palmistry are mingled with the canons of necromancy, <laughs> astrology, spiritualism, superstition. Um, but she said that what she taught was so firmly a science that she felt justification in that manner was barely required. So she's clearly trying to uh, enact a, what would later be called the disenchantment of the magic of um, palmistry. Well, let me turn now to Charlotte Wolf. She encountered the reading of hands through a slightly different tradition. In Germany and Switzerland, palmistry was meeting the new analytic psychology uh, Carl Jung had an interest in palm reading, and it was sparked by a particular student of his, Julius Speer, who arrived at uh, Jung's Zurich school already having practiced palmistry for some years. He called it psychochirology, and it was certainly not about divining the future, not about for fortune telling. It was, he insisted, about potentials and limits of character or re of really personality, a way of perceiving and even diagnosing um, a distinctively modern kind of psychological personality. And unlike Catherine St. Hill and her generation of Anglophone palmists, Julius Speer sought the new phenomenon of the unconscious in the hand. And Charlotte Wolf was one of his students, educated as a medical doctor in Berlin uh, in 1928. She worked as a physician in sexual health uh, and became interested in emerging psychotherapy. But just as Wolf was learning techniques of hand reading from Jung trained Julius Speer, she had to flee Germany after a Gestapo arrest and fortuitous escape. She moved to Paris in 1933, and then she migrated permanently to London in 1936. And over those years, unable to practice medicine, momentarily she turned to quite traditional palmistry to earn money while also pursuing hand-based psychological research within various French and English hospitals. Well, Wolf insisted that she practice hand reading again without recourse to fortune telling or to what by then was really an outdated occult spiritualism of the previous uh, late 19th century avant-garde generation that she wanted to differentiate herself from. Hers was hand expertise shaped far more by early, you know, really first generation de developmental psychology. What is imprinted in the hands of the human fetus, of newborns, of ch children, of adults? What do these palm lines or what anatomists of the hand sometimes called flexure lines, uh, what do they signify? Reading hands and palms invited, especially for a medically trained practitioner like her, a really rich combination of 
um, philosophies of mind and consciousness, um, psychologies of various kinds as they were unfolding over the first decades of the 20th century, as well as a much plainer, in some ways much more surprisingly, a much plainer history of anatomy and physiology, even things like an emerging endocrinology. How did those matters actually affect, uh, or could how, how could those, um, how could anatomy, physiology, and various kinds of pathologies be diagnosed or read through the hand? These were her questions. But there's no doubt that as a refugee and an emigre in Paris and in London, she also made money, simply made money by reading the hands of the famous in a more traditional style. And it was Aldous Huxley who urged that she write a book in English on the human hand. And he set to work cajoling his um, English and French circle, you know, a very esteemed group of, um, of artists and writers to volunteer for a book that she produced in 1936, Studies in Hand Reading. Uh, and it, it included, it was a book that included very famous palms indeed. You can see on your right here, the palm of, the da of, of Nijinsky, the dancer. And she talks specifically about his abnormally small and actually what she calls degenerate thumb of the dancer Nijinsky. She took readings and, uh, and reproduced these ink, um, like thumbprints they are. Uh, many of these uh, handprints and palm prints are very famous people. Man Ray, the photographer, whose photograph we see here, uh, was one of her uh, subjects. Bernard Shaw, Maurice Ravel, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, Aldous Huxley, Julian Huxley. Um, it's really an extraordinary list of celebrities um, from whom she gained money, but whose palms she read and published. She sometimes called herself a chirologist, a practitioner who extracted knowledge from the hand. But much of her interpretation um, reached back to her medical training and she diagnosed endocrine disorders or heart problems. Sometimes her reading was were psychiatric and she would diagnose various mental disorders. More often when she, at least when she read these celebrity hands, she would nominate and describe in great detail a personality far more in a psychoanalytic sense. She would diagnose, and she used that term, on four broad matters in detailed connection with, with one another. First, an inst individual's constitution, she called it, their physique, their physiological tendencies. Second, their temperament. Third, what she called their mentality or different qualities of intelligence. Fourth, what she called their vocation, the capacities for which the individual is gifted by nature, she wrote. And like previous palmists, she read far more than crease lines. Her practical method took in the form of the hand, the nails, the hand's physical qualities, which would indicate heredity and health, parts of the hand, length and shape of fingers, a radial ulna, middle zones, which might show for her the force of the will, she would say, or uh, the relative strength, quote, of the ego and the id. Uh, only then could lines be read accurately. Um, from the lines, an astute reader could derive knowledge of what she called degenerative traits, including simian patterns of the papillary ridges, the strength or weakness of the superego, the degree of nervous, nervous stability and resistance. This was her language. Even though Wolfs distinguished herself in her practice from that of what she called gypsies and fortune tellers, she was clearly familiar and learned with traditional palmistry's claims and wisdoms. And she typically mixed anatomical and palmist terminologies. And sometimes she very deliberately retrieved and sometimes reauthorized um, palmist law. For example, she wouldn't dismiss as superstition the common claim amongst palmists that the length and shape of the thumb, quote, are connected with the power of personality in general and with willpower 
in particular. Uh, she explicitly tested, she said, such chiromantic yeah. belief, and she often but not always um, verified it. At the same time, she noted that crease lines had all, and this is really interesting, I think, she said over and again that, that crease lines um, had been almost entirely ignored by anatomists and other medical scientists who for centuries had been fearful of association with charlatanism. Um, papillary ridges, by contrast, had been, had been closely researched. And there's a line of research here that is also about fingerprints and thumbprints that's um, parallel. Um, she explained character and personality and she signaled formative life events that were resolved and ongoing as she read people's palms. She called her readings portraits. Although her studies were not illustrated with photographs as in the Huxley photographs, uh, they were much more commonly presented in this way, ink hand prints like thumbprints that she took at her sittings and she kept and she catalogued and her remarkable set of papers are, are held now in the Wellcome Library in London. Well, let me turn to this strange thing, the Simeon line, and how that turned palmistry at a certain point and hand reading far more to the clinical uh, domain. Quite separate to the psychological and analytic line in which Wolf was trained, physicians working in asylums especially had already begun to look quite seriously at palms. And this is the domain in which the term simian line or simian crease became common. It did so especially importantly over two generations of the British family, the Down family, the specialist who na whose name was subsequently lent to Down syndrome. In the 1860s, the father, John Langdon Down, looked at the faces of his patients and named the syndrome we know, Mongolism. But his son, Reginald Langdon Down, looked actually less at their faces and more at their palms. And he noted a characteristic hand shape and a common transverse line right across one or both palms and he named it the Simeon line. And this is a photograph from Charlotte Wolf's book where it's a gorilla uh, palm print on our left and you can see the line right across. And quite deliberately, she puts that uh, against what she calls the hand of a male idiot. She says the hand resembles that of a gorilla. Note the primary pattern of the fingerprints, the simian line and the misshapen thumb. Well, let's spend just a little bit more time on this simian line. This is where a link between clinical palm reading, really, and evolutionary biology becomes evident. The early 20th century thesis that newborns with Down syndrome were atavistic evolutionary remnants soon emerged quite directly from the Down family's work on people with Down syndrome. And this was at a, you know, a high moment around 1900 where you know, degeneration anxieties that Daniel Pick has written so um, marvelously about uh, were, were very much at their height. And this story becomes very entwined with that, with that. It became clear that the palms of apes were indeed characterized by one or more transverse lines. The evidence for that became clearer and clearer. One researcher invented a peculiarly reverse nomenclature for the transverse crease in apes, calling it in simians, the mongoloid line. Meanwhile, neonates and people with Down syndrome, others do, other, others, the 2% of humans about who have this strange single crease, about half of them have Down syndrome and half don't. Um, 
but it was beginning to be noted how common this crease was in Down syndrome. And with those people, it was called the Simeon line. So there's this really strange and you know, um, problematic, of course, uh, crossover in these fields. At the same time in the US, the scientific study of creases and lines on palms was named something different. It was named dermatoglyphics. And again, it evaded chiromancy and the kind of popular um, connotations of chirology. And it also crossed uh, physical anthropology and primatology. And so now that I've kind of looked, worked my way through this unlikely field, um, uh, I find lots of books in the 1930s and 40s with titles like Palmar and plantar dermatoglyphics in primates. So long studies, really big books on human hands and feet, feet and their prints and various ki other kinds of primates. Um, this was followed by an influential this introductory textbook on palm expertise because it, becomes, uh, it comes to be taught in various US medical schools. Um, authorized by anatomy and morphology. One book, for example, uh, from 1944 is called Fingerprints, Palms and Souls, uh, used enough to be republished in 1961 and again in 1976. In all this clinical work on um, um, palms, uh, anatomists and physical anthropologists who read hands in their own disciplines, uh, still deployed traditional palmist vocabulary as their own, essentially because there was no other. 19th century anatomists had not really looked at what is a plainly anatomical phenomenon, the crease in the palms. They'd not looked at this, they looked at every other piece of anatomy in the body, but in fact there were no conventional anatomical uh, terms for palm creases. So when by the mid 20th century there's courses on what in America at least was called dermatoglyphics, uh, the anatomists who are teaching it uh, use terms like the heart line, the lifeline and the headline as if they were conventional anatomical terms and indeed we might say that they therefore were. In one text, for example, the medical author describes the simian line thus, he says, instead of a distinct line of life and line of head, the two separate lines, uh, one transverse line only. At the same time, a Calcutta physical anthropologist, S.S. S. Sakar, was quick to point out the area, the error, I'm sorry, as any Indian familiar with Vedic palmistry would. He says, this is obviously a printing mistake in a review. It should be the line of, of the heart. But my point is that that traditional palmist vocabulary fully entered uh, this anatomy, this medical anatomy, disenchanted medical anatomy uh, that was being taught. What were the applications of this knowledge? One was early genetic counselling. Clinicians increasingly aware of the simian line were interested in common patterns between siblings and across generations. And so they sought the palm prints of both parents and siblings of uh, newborns with Down syndrome. A second application was to settle um, an old but lingering debate about race and Down syndrome. A third was simply diagnostic. The, the enduring clinical tradition of inspecting the neonate's palm for the so-called simian line emerged in this period. While research on palm lines was highly specialised and idiosyncratic, but it doesn't follow, therefore, that this was fringe medical work. Results of this material were communicated in nature, it was communicated in the Lancet. Um, palmistry even turned towards some of the exciting developments in post-war heredity and mathematical genetics. In 1945, for example, um, Lionel Penrose, the English um, psychiatrist and geneticist uh, uh, from University College London, conducted his own, what he also called dermatoglyphic 
investigation as part of his extensive Down syndrome research. And he went on to publish on fingerprints, palms and chromosomes was one title one article in Nature in 1963. As late as 1971, he was speaking at a Warsaw conference called Dermatoglyphics in Human Genetics. Lionel Penrose, a very distinguished uh, medical geneticist, was writing a book on fingerprints and palmistry when he died. Uh, and a precy of this was published posthumously in The Lancet in 1973, including analysis of the simian line. And even there in The Lancet, it's still explained via palmist terms, quote, the five finger and the three finger creases, the lines of the head and the lines of the heart. Well, Charlotte Wolfe integrated this so-called simian line firmly into her own mix of clinical practice and hand reading. Over her career uh, in London, she had no hesitation at all in diagnosing individuals for decades from the presence of the simian line. And this continued right through into the 1970s. Uh, and actually, it's clear from her papers held uh, in the Wellcome Library in London that clinical psychiatrists from around the world actively sought her hand expertise as an aid to their own diagnosis. So in reading prints that were sent to her from a New York psychiatrist in 1973, for example, Wolf explained to this psychiatrist, the simian line runs in families and clearly in this family and it's of genetic significance. She said, where there is no indication of mental deficiency, this trait will still point to emotional unbalance, generally in a schizoid personality. So that's her, uh, essentially her consultant's uh, commentary on a particular case that a New York psychiatrist sought um, further opinions on. Of another handprint sent to her for assessment, she declared a simian line in both palms. Um, and her simian line research illuminated other elements of hand psychology too. Um, 500 simian lines she studied in a certain uh, set of years, and she took note that 55% were in the left hand, 30% in both hands, 15% in the right hand. And she drew conclusions from this. She said these stigmata, which are characteristic of neurotic disturbances, some conflict between the ego and the id, confirm that the left is the hand of the subconscious mind and the primate emotions. So in that kind of diagnosis, we can see a real mix of these traditions of hand reading. Well, let me turn finally to uh, primatology, which was for me the most um, surprising element out of this research. This was another application of the Simeon Nine Line knowledge that shed light on uh, human evolutionary history and its connection to evolutionary biology. And Wolf, although she'd been trained in that at developmental psychology, analytic psychology discipline around Jung and then Speer. And she's clearly bringing that psychoanalytic thought uh, tradition forward. She also has another line of the study and more plainly anatomical line of the study of the hands in which she defines herself. And time and again, Wolf nominated her own intellectual genealogy as much in natural science and natural history and comparative anatomy of the 19th century as in German psychologies of the 20th century. And in her writings over many decades, she almost always noted the, the work of this natural theologian, Charles Bell, and his comparative anatomy of the hand. And she understood him to have perceived, quote, the whole psychological significance of the hand a century ago. And um, some of you in the history of science might recognize Charles Bell as a very important, what is called in the Anglophone tradition, natural theology, um, connecting human anatomy with divine design. 
And Charles Bell was a kind of a last gasp of that, um, that idea, but he very much uh, uh, had this idea that the hand was um, what he called the ready instrument of the mind, divinely delivered, that the human hand was especially eloquent. And so we can see in some ways why Charlotte Wolfe was quite uh, enchanted actually by his work. All of the subsequent research work comparing human and simian hands, palms and fingers, Wolf actually thought was inspired by the comparative anatomist T.H. Huxley, and especially his very famous 1863 book, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. And she almost always nominated this as, as the second key text that propelled her own interest in comparative anatomy of the hand. And it was in this very conventional natural science tradition of comparative anatomy. You know, by 1920, this is incredibly old fashioned kinds of natural history work. Um, uh, but it's through that that she sought to throw some of her own light on evolutionary history and biology. Her 20th century question really just recapitulated Thomas Henry Huxley's own question. What do comparative studies of a range of ape and human extremities tell us about their anatomical similarities and their evolutionary connection? It's by this stage a really old fashioned um, foundational uh, element of natural, uh, uh, natural sciences. She concluded um, from work through the 1930s and 40s that the chimpanzee has the greatest resemblance to the human hand um, and that the gorilla hand resembles the human hand actually more closely than any other anthropoid. And she noted from her expertise that the crease line in the palms, she said, are analogous to those in the human hand. But how did she know this? How did she acquire gorilla and chimpanzee palm and fingerprints that were data for her comparative zoological studies. Well, as I've said, from 1936, um, Charlotte Wolfe had emigrated permanently to London. And it so happens that the grandson of T.H. Huxley was Wolfe's uh, entree to the primate world. Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brother, was just then secretary of the London Zoo in Regent's Park. And through Aldous and that Parisian connection from the early 1930s, uh, Charlotte Wolfe was introduced to the wider Huxley um, family as a devotee of the grandfather's, the great, the grandfather's great work, uh, T.H. Huxley's great work. She was kind of welcomed into this London-based um, Huxley uh, world. And all of the wider Huxley family had their hands read in a conventional way by Charlotte Wolfe. Um, but Julian Huxley just then had his own biological interest in the hand as uh, an indicator of evolution, the hand as an evolved fin. Um, and this work then completely exceeded the palmistry interest of his brother's inclinations. So Aldous Huxley, Aldous Huxley is you know, famously well known for his um, otherworldliness, his interest in occult, his interest in uh, uh, varieties of consciousness, I suppose is ways of putting it. And it's through that route that he was interested in palmistry, but not for his scientist brother, Julian. It was the evolutionary anatomy element that he was most interested in. And so Julian Huxley, who lived in London Zoo, as well as being the secretary of it, um, secured Charlotte Wolfe good access to his monkeys and his apes to take handprints, footprints, and in some cases, fingerprints. And here we have one. And these are all kept quite in quite rough order, actually, in the Welcome li Library um, in London. But there are many, many uh, of them. And you can see human-like. They're quite roughly organized and put together and with her own notations over them. Um, Julian uh, Huxley instructed the superintendent of the zoo and the keeper of the primates to give her all kinds of assistance. Uh, and she was advised which monkeys and apes were safe and which weren't. 
Um, but the juvenile gorilla that they had there at that point um, was firmly off limits for Charlotte Wolf herself. Um, he said, he wrote to her and he said, I don't allow anybody to go in uh, with the gorilla for fear of infection, but if you will arrange a day, um, I will take the prints for you under instruction. And we just happened to have a remarkable photo of just that, which I came across in just very recently. So this is the keeper of the primates in 1936 instructed, I don't think the photograph is taken by Charlotte Wolf, although possibly, uh, in, she is standing off the camera, uh, instructing the keeper how to take a sufficient ink print of the gorilla's um, hands. Well, just as Wolf sought an individual psychology in humans, she would write about their gestalt, so she found individuals in the apes with whom she worked, beginning with their zoo bestowed pet names. She took prints of the hands and feet of, of individualized and named zoo apes, Daisy, the chimpanzee, Gertie, the chimpanzee, both two-year-olds, another called Fifi, a 14-year-old uh, chimpanzee, another called Boo Boo, 16-year-old, uh, Chimpanzee. And they all showed simian lines, which you can see here, the clear, straight, transverse line. And she also analysed, as she would in any human, all the other interesting features, where the thumb is set, the proportion of the margin below the transverse crease, in relation to the radial margin of the hand, generally she said much longer in apes, there was structure she also found in some humans. Um, she was interested if the ring finger was longer than the index finger, a feature which she found in about 50% of humans and 50% of apes, she said. Her newest find that she published was that the crease lines in simians actually changed with age. The older the chimpanzee, the more longitudinal crease lines appeared to cross transverse lines. And through her research, um, and this is what I've become really interested in, through her research, palm reading turned into plain zoological study. Julian Huxley read her papers to the Zoological Society in London, and they were published in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London. So there's a complete conversion here of palm, of a palmistry tradition into plain zoology. In her papers, Wolf, Wolf printed and compared the, the hands and feet of every kind of simian from whom she could take prints. Um, she worked with lemurs, with tantalus monkeys, with baboons, marmosets, squirrel monkeys, gibbons, as well as chimpanzees. She found that the right and the left lines were markedly different in the baboon uh, compared to other simians. And while the crease lines in the foot of an aged chimpanzee showed no resemblance, she said, to normal man, it did show some resemblance, quote, to those of an insane person. So she's folding all of that psychiatric work back into uh, this zoological work. When Regent's par a Park's um, gorilla who they named Mock, M-O-K, -K, um, a gorilla who was free born as they, as they would always say in the Congo. When Mock died in a Regent's Park cage in 1938, um, Charlotte Wolf obtained prints of his hands two days after his death. Here they are. She took a hand, a foot, a finger, and a thumbprint from the dead beast. And she reprinted them with writing another article in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London. And in doing so, she added simian psychology to the history of palmistry and palmistry to the history of psychology. Yet this, um, in some ways, simply anatomical work um, 
always was overlaid with her psychological interests. Sorry, let me just go back. Um, let me just go through. To a palm print, this palm print here of uh, Peter the chimpanzee, seven and a half years, she writes here. The more she looked at apes' palms, the more psychologi the psychological domain kept intruding into her reading of this work. In some ways, Charlotte Wolf's career with hands might add up to a kind of primate psychobiology. I'm still thinking this through. Over time, she did become increasingly inclined towards an anatomical and physiological implication, as we've seen, but interpreting the meaning of palm lines always involves psychology too, she insisted. She would say, apes also have interior lives and they would be evident and readable from palms. And so when she took the print of seven-year-old Peter that you see here, she read it thus. Peter, who is seven years and six months of age, has a hand with particularly few lines and arrangement which is distinctly of the juvenile type. As the juvenile chimpanzee, which is not yet fully under the influence of the sexual emotions, is more intelligent than the adult one, the unusual intelligence of the chimpanzee, Peter, may perhaps be explained as a result of delayed emotional development. So here she's completely folding that early psychology and particular strands of analysis into her reading, not just of humans, but of simians. Charlotte Wolf engaged in simian palm reading. Just like humans, she posited that the mentality and the emotionality of chimpanzees have a correlation, she would say, with the lineal composition of their hands. And she read the hand of Peter in just the same way as she read the hands of Julian and Aldous Huxley. Well, let me just draw this together. When I first realized that the, the Huxley brothers' beautiful photographs of hands pointed to palm reading, which was not an obvious thing to me, it was not a difficult thing to find out, but it was not what had first occurred to me. Um, I thought I would be pursuing a kind of Aldous Huxley-like line of inquiry around spiritualism or occultism or consciousness. Um, but really in this lecture one point has been to demonstrate that reading these hands within that can, with the, within that tradition uh, is insufficient because this hand reading in fact joined a far more conventional history of anatomy of zoology of primatology and even of clinical medicine so i think that hand reading is perhaps an overlooked instance in historians and sociologists ongoing discussion about enchantment and disenchantment and re-enchantment of modern Western culture and science. Palm reading turns out, I think, to be far more germane to this historiographical and sociological debate than a much more common focus on, say, spiritualist practices, um, uh, the kind of otherworldly communication that was fashionable in Weber's own time. I think that's actually a weak instance of an old and enchanted practice becoming modern. Palm reading, I think, is a much stronger example. Um, it didn't just claim to be part of science and medicine. Re recall that Catherine St. Hill kind of school and regulation of palmistry, that's, that's disenchantment. Um, but it's not just that. Perhaps more significantly, um, um, researchers that were reliant on palmist ter terminology redeployed them in these fields of gen medical genetics, uh, psychiatry, and zoology. We see here the links between palmistry and anthropometry, psychological measurement of selves that developed so strongly over the 20th century. And it's just erroneous to see this as somehow parapsychology, 
This is actual psychology in disciplinary terms. And as we've seen, the long if specialized history of hand anatomy morphed into detailed comparative anatomy of primates' palms, thus entering primatology and human evolutionary studies. And in fact, in primatology uh, now, there is um, a, a subdiscipline uh, that is sometimes still called evolutionary palmistry. Obviously, traditional palmists now take crease lines, including the simian line, entirely seriously. But far more importantly, for our purposes or for my purpose, so do clinicians in some of the world's most reputable health institutions. This, to me, is the more surprising point. Now I know that in New York, Mount Sinai Hospital, there is online instruction on the meaning of the simian crease now forming in the 12th week of gestation in one of 30 people. Uh, the website is really intended to instruct parents. Uh, it says this simian line may be normal, it reassures parents and mean nothing, but it may be associated with conditions that affect mental and physical growth. Uh, if a neonate has a simian crease, parents are forewarned on this uh, site, uh, the doctor may ask, is there a family history of Down syndrome? Does anyone else in the family have a single palmar crease without other symptoms? So here we have the simian line uh, influencing, um, uh, influencing processes, at least a diagnosis. So for me, palm reading offers a really idiosyncratic crossover between modern magic and modern science. In it, we see an instance of plain disenchantment of clearest order. The magic of palm reading becomes, on one trajectory, rationalised as learnable, teachable, even examinable. But with Charlotte Wolfe's instance, it becomes more than that. It actually is anatomy. This history of hand reading certainly shows us that the re-enchantment thesis is not enough and that it's not enough to imagine this enduring palm reading magic as a kind of a quirky marginal practice that makes medical history fascinating, like mesmerism, for example, or like phrenology. Instead, this is the history of medicine. It became part of zoology. It became part of comparative anatomy. That's what really interests me. In late modern chiromancy, we can track not just claims to science, but a, line, a really curious line of psychology, psychiatry, anatomy and primatology that was hand reading and palm reading. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for choosing us to be the first um, to have uh, a glimpse at uh, your new work. I have... Um, Two questions to start us off. Um, the first is, um, how do you connect, or perhaps it shouldn't be connected, um, palm reading to physiognomy, which seems a relevant intellectual pedigree um, to palm history, to reading palm history. And another aspect is, um, gender, um, the fact that she is a woman, a woman alone um, among many men, um, to what extent that played a role? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so physiognomy is what ties in to some extent with the 19th century. So phrenology, phrenology of the hand and hand reading and physiognomy would be tied together fairly easily in francophone, at least I know in francophone and anglophone traditions in the mid 19th century. And I think that thereafter there's a bit of a separation. So I haven't come across, in the 19th century, I come across books where reading hands and reading other kinds of physiognomy are written about together. In the 20th century, they seem to separate out. And I, the, 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 the more classic physiognomy seems to go on another route and is separated out from, from palm reading, insofar as I understand that material uh, in my research so far, more in both French and in, in English. But there's, 
but they're tied together in the 19th century for sure. Um, as far as gender goes, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a very, it's an excellent question, entirely germane. Um, there, in the 19th century, there are both male and female palm readers in that elite layer of the people who would make money from celebrity palm reading, if I can put it that way. Uh, Catherine St. Hill is one. This is the tradition that Charlotte Wolfe comes after. And there are quite a few men who also do the same thing. And the most famous is a man called Cairo, C-H-E-I-R-O. And in fact, he's an Irishman uh, who I only learned the other day who I only learned the other day in a conversation with an Indian friend, happens to be quite well known in Northern India still. Uh, and Cairo was an Irishman. I'll try and, and speed up this story. He fascinates me. Um, uh, an Irishman who in late 19th century London was kind of dismissed by Catherine St. Hill and the people who were trying to render palm reading scientific. And because he, he was a celebrity palm reader, he read the part, hands of the Prince of Wales and of prime ministers, and you know, he made a lot of money from doing it. And she put him entirely off to one side. But in fact, now that I've done some research on him, he has a kind of an original expertise because it turns out, bizarrely, that he spent 10 years in the 1870s living in northern India, learning Vedic palmistry from the original knowers of this tradition, where the Roma and Persian palmistry comes across to Europe from in the first place. So he's got a decade of instruction in the kind of original knowledge that he's turning into this kind of pop um, palmistry. So in a way, he's got more uh, original authority than any of the others. It's a very interesting story. I think through the 20th century, palmistry does get connected with women. Why would that be? That's something I still have to continue. I, it, it's probably, uh, I would say, it's a leftover from the highly gendered occultism, again, that I know best in France and England, in the, in the 1890s, that kind of high spiritualist moment, which is connected also with theosophy, which is led, we know, by a woman, Madame Blavatsky. So that whole kind of era or generation of spiritualism and occultism has a lot of female leaders in it, if I can put it that way. And I think that through the 20th century that even though people like Charlotte Wolfe is medically trained and she's distancing herself, I think she's, um, she's following from that. And the other thing that is um, Charlotte Wolfe may be known to um, some of you listening. Uh, and again, I'll be trying to be quite quick. She, she's known in a different historiographical tradition at all, which is precisely about gender. Because Charlotte Wolfe was a, a an early sexological researcher who worked with Magnus Hirschfeld in Berlin. She moved to London and starts kind of quasi sexological research in the 1920s and 30s in London as a lesbian. She ends up writing, doing studies of bisexuality and writing books about gender and sexuality through her whole life. And for historians, of, for British historians of gender and sexuality, she's not unknown and she's, but she's, but her hand reading expertise for that group of historians is kind of the quirky bit. For them, it's the fact that she worked with Magnus Hirschfeld in 1920s sexology and she's still alive in 1970s and when did she die? She's certainly alive through the 1970s. And so she's picking up that very early moment of history of sexuality and gender and women's history in London. She's alive and she writes a biography of Magnus Hirschfeld, but she's there in that original moment with Magnus Hirschfeld in Weimar, Berlin. And so she's, she's not unknown actually historically, but for those historians, that's the most interesting thing about her. For me, that's interesting, but it's, it's as, as palmist and hand reader that I'm most interested in her. So um, as I move forward with this project, gender is everywhere.
Jill is always everywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, Snait, please go ahead and then Amir. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. And I want to just point out to the um, local branch of palmistry, which has an interesting history that very that hasn't been followed actually. Julia Speer later married Erich Neumann, who was a very central uh, disciple of uh, Jung. And when they fled from Europe to Palestine, he became one of the people that was involved in the foundation of the Psychoanalytic Institute in Jerusalem. And she developed this, this art of uh, Jungian psychoanalysis, reading of hand into a profession, which she followed for many, many years. And there is, I think, still a collection of her handprints, which probably her son, Micha Neumann, who until I think a couple of years ago, was the head of the psychiatrist, the, the largest psychiatrist clinic in Jerusalem, the public psychiatry clinic. Yeah. And so this is a really a history that hasn't been followed, but it's interesting because she also, um, Julia Neumann, I mean, she really mixed um, traditional palmistry with psychoanalysis. And she published a little bit in, in German and in English on her work and had a very large collection of handprints. And she also, at some stage, wanted to, uh, to see whether she could follow the difference in, in palms between people from different con Jewish congregation after the 50s and the 60s. So, from, from many angles, I think it would be really interesting to see how local conditions really turned her into this kind of work. And I think her son, Micha Neumann, could really tell a lot about this. Thank you so much. I've been looking for you on my screen, but I don't think you've got your video on, which is, which is a shame. Um, and hello, and thank you very much for that. So. So Julia Speer came to Jerusalem? Yeah, she, she, she married Erich Neumann, who, who at the time was a very well-known Jungian scholar okay. who wrote okay. about, a lot about art and, and, and the archetypes of art. Okay, okay, but, and they came. Look, mm -hmm. I thank you very much for that information. It's extremely useful. And I think that there is you know, in my mind, as I move forward with this um, project, it's really exciting to deliver, to deliver this paper. You know, um, I don't know if it's exciting to hear, it's certainly exciting to deliver it and, and to pull some of these ideas together. Uh, and to, you know, in a way, you know, a, a, in a way, giving a first paper like this really is a test run for a historian about whether this has a life as an article, whether it has life as enough interest um, to be pursued as a, as a longer and bigger study as a book. And I'm certainly, um, the more I hear uh, that particular um, that particular kind of um, geography and story there through other inheritors of mind-body disciplines, you know, of the 20th century, already there's something interesting to, um, to follow through with. And I think that there is you know, for me, this is shaping up to be potentially a very interesting multi-sided or even global history of how we read the the expertise, the different expertise over time through which hands are read. You know, that could that could have an early modern, you know, beginning with 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 different kinds of religious ways of reading bodies right through the tradition that you're talking about here into uh, mid 20th century and later 20th century psychoanalysis. I'm gonna follow all that up and thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Okay, Amir, please. You raised your digital hand before yeah. the end of the day. <laughs> um, thank you, Professor Bashford. This was uh, fascinating. Um, I just finished writing a paper about fingerprint genetics in the um, mid 20th century following the work of Christine Bonvie, who is a Norwegian scholar. Um, 
Uh, and I would be happy to send you that paper because it's thing I think I mean and, and to talk with you further about it uh, because I think it's very relevant to to many of the themes that you raised. Um, so from that angle, I want to say something about uh, also um, the question about gender and and who does this job, but not from the psychoanalytic spiritual perspective, but from the dermatological one. Um, so in Germany or in the German speaking world, but especially in Germany, dermatology was overrepresented by Jews. I mean, J J Jewish um, doctors, um, partly because uh, it was, you know, not something that all the like non-Jewish doctors wanted to do. So it was a niche. It was a niche that many uh, Jews found, found themselves in. And it was also connected to sexual transmitted diseases. Uh, so there's, as you said, so like the sexology and dermatology are intimately connected, uh, which also yeah. then uh, um, built into later anti-Semitic perceptions of Jewish doctors and, and infections with, with uh, venereal diseases and all kinds of anxieties there. Um, uh, and um, so, so the, the, those who work on, on fingerprints and on also like lines of on the fingers and on the hands in Germany are are Jews and women and, th and then there is like over representation not over but you know the uh, uh, there are more women in this in kind of profession than in in other um, areas um, and Simon Cole do you know the book by Simon Cole about fingerprints yes. yeah so he suggests that this also testifies to the like marginal uh, place of of all this work on fingerprints and dermatology in the overall scientific profession, because there are, there are indeed many women working on that uh, or in that area. Um, so these are just you know a couple of, of remarks. Um, I do want to ask you about the. Um, I mean, you didn't go uh, really deep into the more scientific aspects of of this uh, study, which. Many of them have to do with um, the nervous system and neurological development, right? So, so the links between uh, all kinds of mental disabilities or neurological disabilities and the hand go back to embryological development and early uh, all kinds of di distortions in the normal growth of the fetus, which then have their, you know, can we can see them uh, by the mental development, but also like the hand testifies on that. And in a sense, when we do these all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of examinations of, uh, you know, pregnancy tests, like this transparency, nuclear transparency screening, uh, we also use the same kind of idea. We can see something physical, but it indicates a problem in uh, development of the neurological system. Um, so that's a way to do that. Um, and my question is, do you know if the, I mean, in your example, for, for, uh, for instance, the, um, the discussion on the, the men, like the, the psychological discussion, how much is the psychological discussion um, and the psychoanalytic discussion, how much is it aligned with this kind of neurological, you know, more like neurological, physiological growth embryological discussion. I mean, because oh, the, the ego and the id and all of these are not really there in the, in, like, in, in the neuron system, right? But, uh, but the mental development can be, you know? So I wonder how scientific in that sense was the, was the psychological discussion. How, how uh, was it really like neurological in a sense or was it in another world? Mm -hmm. I hope that well, my for, question is clear for... enough. Yeah. yeah, no, thanks for all that. And I, in a way, I'm making a very clear note of the dermatology, sexology link. So it's not inconsequential at all, is it, that she has a, has an original sexology interest, actually, as a medical doctor. And so thank you very much for that. Um, and certainly, you know, she is certainly this whole field is deeply connected with um, the phenomenon of, of um, fingerprinting and its um, broker in the first instance. I've still got to do some work on this, but I think it's him in the first instance who uses the term Simeon line and then the Down family in England borrow, borrow that. Um, and so this kind of criminological 
uh, mix with fingerprinting and identification and so forth is entirely tied up um, uh, as, as another line of this, of this story. The embryological and neurolo uh, and, the, and, the, and the kind of neurology was, I would say, distant from what Charlotte Wolf herself was doing. On the one hand, she's very tied up with British psychoanalytic circles in the 19, unsurprisingly, in the 19, let's say 1930s and 40s. And British psychoanalysts, Marjorie Briley, for example, um, uh, after Klein, was, um, had a sense of themselves as having a particular specialty in psychoanalysis uh, of infancy. And so in this era, that's what really, especially London-based psychoanalysts imagined that their particular specialty was. And she was quite tied up with, um, with that domain of, uh, of, of post-Klein psychoanalysis. Was she connected to the neurology and physiology circles? I would say much less so. And that's why I'm quite interested and I tried to emphasize how her, it's much more anatomy than physiology or neurology. And, and that's why I tried to emphasize how in some ways old fashioned her work was. It, it, it fits much more like a kind of a pure anatomy of the mid 19th century than complicated physiology of embryologists or neurologists of the 1920s and 30s. And so it's quite for her in particular, and I've got to do much more research on, actually I've got to do much more research on how idiosyncratic she was. Uh, at the moment, I see her as quite an idiosyncratic, uh, think knower of hands, if I can put it that way, who folds together many, many of these um, expertise. But I've got a lot of work to do to really uh, know, that, know that myself. But as a knower of hands and as a researcher of human and animal um, handprints, it's quite basic foundational, much more anatomical work than anything else that she's doing. And then she's doing very, very pretty basic, crude, if interesting, statistical work on her data sets, which might be 500, 600, 700, um, handprints and that's the data that some of the geneticists and some of the mathematical geneticists like Lionel Penrose are nonetheless picking up but they're doing the, the technical and the difficult work with it she's doing pretty um, pretty basic and foundational uh, a, 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 I think anatomical work and for her the complexity <clears throat> then moves back to the psychoanalytic work rather than the other way towards physiology or neurology, or let's say um, embry embryology. Thank you. And Oded, now your turn, please. Yes, thank you very much. I really wanted to ask something as a complete outsider to the field. As I was listening to you, I was thinking about whether there's an art historical component to the story or a potential art historical component. Because for one thing, the leading academic discipline of thinking about lines in the early 20th century is German art history. They're doing formalism at the most serious level. They're trying to connect it to other things. Second, this is a very major stream of immigrants from Germany in the 20s and 30s who go to London. But this was all neither here nor there for me as I was listening to your talk. But Snaid comments about the Jungian connections made me think that perhaps there's something serious about it because this is what gets all those people interested in art and because of thinking about archetypes and they're very interested in art in discovering this. And I was just wondering whether there's a chance that none of those people is involved in art history directly, but surely it might be something they all read because they're serious amateurs of it, because they're concerned with similar problems. And then the art is rethinking about lines can be actually thing which is influenced by the reading of art history, of 20s and 30s art history. Lines, L-I-N-E-S, 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. Thank you. The art history that comes in. Uh, I haven't thought of all at all about other theorists of lines. I've been distracted by knowers of hands. And so actually to think about what lines mean is a very, very interesting uh, way forward because sometimes she would write about her prints as engravings, you know, so where the wood engravings and the ink comes in. And so she's actually, if we, if I'm able to share my screen again, if we look at her prints, she's, um, sorry, I don't want to, you know, she's, re she's describing these as engravings and she's almost thinking of herself actually as a printmaker. Um, and and I, I didn't include it, but there is some very technical explanation that she goes into in her books about how she makes these prints, what the materials are. She said the best thing to use is, in fact, uh, I can't remember the name of it, it's a, it's a 1930s men's hair oil. She says that's the best oil to use. And then she talks about a... Uh, she uses materials from that um, a charcoal artists use to kind of set their work. And so, in fact, as prints, I, mean, I know this is different from theorists of lines, and uh, but but uh, but there is a way in which these you know, can and may, and I hope will be read interestingly as very very curious print prints and printmaking that. You know, if we overlay all of this with work, you know, so many historians and so many scholars now are really interested in human animal re relations, right? Here we have these incredibly intimate portraits that turn into prints with lines. You know, in this instance, this incredibly poignant and intimate print of the two day dead gorilla. That's what these fingerprints and left thumbprint you see here is. And so, you know, as visual pieces, they're readable actually in many different, I know that's different to what you were saying, but, but more connected to what you were saying. In fact, Charlotte Wolfe gets taken up in Paris by the Surrealists. And it's the Surrealist, early Surrealist magazines that she publishes her first hand reading work in. And that's that that kind of launches her. It's that it's that it's that group, um, and partly through that, but not only, is why Man, Man Ray we see here is interested in her as uh, as a hand reader, obviously, but he's interested in her as a sitter for one of his, um, I mean, it's a really curious portrait and in, in a way it couldn't be by anybody except Man Ray, you know. Um, but she circles around these, she's in these artistic circles. Um, but at this point, it's what I know most about so far is her Parisian circles and her connection with surrealists. But what, what is behind that in Weimar, Germany, I think, uh, and in the Berlin in which she's learning medicine and so forth, I think is a very interesting thing to pursue. But I must say that um, you've kind of hit on what for me is an exciting prospect as I move forward with this project. And that is how do we, you know, what might we do with these extraordinary prints and think about them as printmaking, um, as well as kinds of anatomy. And I think that you know, it may be that in the future with the wonderful Welcome Trust in London, there's something to be done about, about hands and identity and ways of thinking minds and souls and bodies and, and, and pieces of artwork in which, in fact, the phenomenon of lines and how to read lines may, may come forward. So thank you very much indeed for that comment. Snaid, you wanted to join us again. Snaid, you're muted.
just one short comment and one short question for Oded. Erich Neumann's central book is actually on art, and it was translated into Hebrew a few years ago. So it's called Amo and Psyche. And so um, you can see that. But there, I have a question which I don't know to what extent can be answered. If she, if uh, Charlotte Wolf was interested in, in physiology and so on of the late 19th century, then the, the major view of the brain as formed by Eugling Jackson and then by Henry Head was that of a hierarchy. In what sense the way she looked at the hand and related it to anatomy and to the brain, in what sense did this find place in her work or not at all? I don't think at all. Thank you for that. I, I don't, I've never read her use the word brain, write about the brain. It, she's too, the, 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 the piece of crude British, uh, crude British, crude anatomy that she's interested in is the hand and the foot and the finger and the other side. Is she interested in other parts of the human body? The only other part is the mind. And yeah. she doesn't connect in the way that we know. I mean, Thomas Henry Huxley, for instance, in the 1860s and 70s, he's already trying to think through yeah. brains and minds. I and mean, it's a classic 19th century question. Um, how do you think about the connection between the brain and sensation? Yeah. And she would know about that because I know that she read his work on that very closely, but I don't think she was interested enough in, say, the anatomy of the brain or, again, the neurologicals to work through that um, tradition, that th to work through that tradition of, of scholarship. Um, What, what I have to do work on, uh, you know, whenever we can all travel and get to these archives is probably some Berlin material, which will tell me why she's, really why she's hooking up with Hirschfeld apart from obvious reasons. And whether it's the neurological Hirschfeld that she's interested in. So how she gets to early sexology in particular for met through, medic, through her medical training. And I think that will give me some sense of what, what in the late 1920s in Berlin, what is the kind of medicine that she's learning and how she gets from that to sexology to spear and, and hand reading. And then, and then she, but it's really clear, it's really clear that, she, that it's the hand and the palm in particular, not other organs of the body, and not even in relation to other organs of the body that, so, that, that interests her. So it means that the question of body and mind doesn't really bother her. She's not a parallelist or anything of the kind. She just doesn't deal with it. I don't think so. It is, it is like there is a gap between what is written here and what is... Okay. Uh, unaccessible or understandable in yeah. an unconscious or in a personality, yeah. as if there are these two ends and two mediums, I suppose, uh, and how they get from one to the other is, so far, I, d I don't think of, of, of particular interest to her. Thank you. Thank you. And, and in a way, her, um, her foray into... You know, she has this psychoanalytic tradition, but then she also connects up with far more conventional clinical psychiatry. You know, she's working in France and in England with non-psychoanalytic, I mean, even anti-psychoanalytic psychiatrists, you know, alienists in children's institutions yeah. who are doing the very kind of crude, old-fashioned uh, you know, st still various kinds of research. And in a way, that's where the Down syndrome material comes from as well. And in a way, the, the psychoanalytic line that she's to some extent trained in, she can also set that aside and work much more in a, in a kind of a fairly conventional, you know, 1920s, 30s um, psychiatric institutions, uh, institutions as well. So, you know, I mean, 
what interests me also is 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 this in this one figure we have such an a, an amalgam that doesn't add up to a consistent line but a really interesting you know mishmash of strange 20th century ways of understanding this thing called the human hand you know and as trained as a medical historian really in the 1990s there was a moment in the 1990s for historians when um you know the, the the really exciting thing that we learned was that human bodies have a history you know and now this is very familiar you know, it's a very familiar thing to say but I can remember in the 1990s when I was training as a PhD student in the Wellcome Library in London and we were all Roy Porter was there and he was writing about bodies and histories and we had to reconceptualize uh, our ideas about human bodies that their conceptualization of them changes over the time. Now it's a completely standard thing, but it was such an exciting prospect. And thereafter, um, various historians have, you know, we know this, have, have been interested in parts of the body. But I, I search high and low for interesting studies of the hand by hands by historians. And I think that for me, what will be exciting is to think about you know, the, the many languages of the hand, I suppose, and the many expertise of the hand. And possibly moving forward, there's, there's um, exciting scholarship to bring to this study that comes from another field altogether, and that is the history of the senses. That a lot of, how do we think about the five senses in historical terms is something that a lot of historians are quite interested in. The, in. And it's made me think about the even very conventional fortune telling palm reading is this sensory experience that is a, a touch, uh, but it's also visual because it's literally a reading, um, but it folds also into strangely confessional psychoanalytic relations between the hand reader, um, you know, and, and the receiver. Um, but it's a strange kind of reverse where in hand reading it's the hand reader who does the talking and the people the person whose hands are being read is meant to be silent and so it's a complete inversion of the kind of confessional psychoanalytic relationship but I think nonetheless there's a for me there's an exciting possibility of putting uh, a new case I suppose or a new substance to a world of scholarship that bring that is, that, that is interesting people at the moment, the history of how we think about the history of five senses also, also historically. Thank you. Um, Amir, please. And just one, one small addition, since the, the German context seems to be something that, that's, that, um, that is relevant for your story, I think there was an exhibition uh, a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years ago in Germany, I think I have the catalog in my office, my real office, not the fake one uh, behind me right now, um, um, where they they took lots of like a hand hand prints from um, prisoners in concentration camps, um, uh, where their their hands were you know the prints were taken, but now they did a kind of exhibition of just showing these hands and then they uh, wrote the stories of these this persons underneath or something like that. So I think it was an interesting um, uh, attempt connecting memory uh, and, you know, some kind of artistic way of, and, and, and very relevant to, to the issues that, that you're dealing with. So again, I'll, I'll send you the reference uh, uh, once I'm in my real office. Uh, but Thank I think, you. Um, but I think the German, I mean, the German context and what happens with the hands in Germany is, is, is really, um, yeah. as you said, relevant to, to your story. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, Amir. And I look forward to receiving your, both that and the previous paper that you mentioned. I'd be very grateful and to continue some conversations because there's absolutely, a, that story is relevant. The fingerprint story is very relevant as well. Um, so thank you. Um, Annabella, please, your turn. Hi, thank you very much for this uh, so interesting lecture. Um, I, I admit that I really don't know nothing about um, uh, this kind of medicine and history of 
medicine in Hans Reading. Um, and uh, at the beginning, I was finishing one of my other duties, so I, I couldn't uh, listen. So I'm sorry if you already said that. But I, it seems that uh, in the end, um, she, she got uh, kind of severe um, criticism uh, right from her, uh, from her colleagues or and and she did, and she uh, finished moving back to uh, sexology or sexuality uh, studies and writing more about bisexuality um, like her two uh, her two final books are not about hand hand write re uh, reading right mm -hmm. are about more more about uh, bisexuality and lesbianism. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm very sorry if you said something like uh, about that, but if not, um, I, yes, uh, I, I wanted to ask about uh, the, like, what, if you can elaborate about this moving back to uh, like concentrate on bisexuality. Um, she all the time published about that, right? But at the end, she really concentrated only on that. Um, and and if if by any, I, I don't know if if she used her knowledge in hand reading also to write about uh, her uh, the the bisexuality and lesbianism and sexuality in general. Uh, so on and and like the 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 attachment between the hand reading and the sexology. So thank you for that uh, question. I just looked up my notes. So it's 1986 she dies uh, in London, um, and you're quite right that that uh, there's a cluster of books published by Charlotte Wolf on hand reading from the 1930s through to the early 1950s. Uh, and then there's another cluster of books on bisexuality and memoir, actually. And I think it's partly that she does a not uncommon turn uh, late in life uh, to writing memoir that she writes her other books on bisexuality as well. And there in the 1970s, and I think actually into the 1980s, if I, I remember. So you're quite right that there are these two, as far as she writes books, there are these two clusters. Um, however, it, her, her hand, hand reading work, um, her hand reading work wasn't, by some people, her hand reading work through the 1970s is worthy of co medical consultation. So she's not dismissed as a marginal uh, quack, quirk or quirky figure by some in psychiatry. And so that's very evident as I, as I did indicate um, somewhere in the paper that in the light in her papers in London in Welcome Library, there are many many folders of psychiatrists. Um, it is true it's they're mainly New York based, but not solely, sending her the handprints of their patients, and uh, sending her their diagnosis and asking her. It's a it's a medical consultation. And so these were these fade away by at least as far as the collection is concerned. Um, these start fading away by the late seventies, but through nineteen seventy to seventy five, you know, she's not infrequently uh, her expertise is sought by by psycho by a number of psychiatrists. Um, uh, but it is, I would say, in London, where she's in London, um, she becomes, she, she's picked up partly as a memoirist, but she's picked up by Nanin a new uh, uh, gender and sexual culture of the 1970s in London. 
that is really interested in his sexuality. The historians who were suddenly fascinated by Magnus Hirschfeld in 1920s Berlin realize that one of his students and medical officers and co-workers is living down the road. Um, they do interviews with her. She becomes kind of embraced by a very particular London 1970s women's history, history of sexuality, subculture itself, actually. Uh, and, uh, she, and her memoirs come about. She, find, she publishes with Virago, the press that is connected to that London subculture. And so, and so it's, and then, as I said before, then, you know, that she published books on handwriting is kind of an interesting, quirky sideline to them. That she worked with Hirschfeld and she's lived as a lesbian her whole life is a thing that's really interested uh, openly, her, is the thing that is really interests this group. And, you know, that it's the group that have this publishing house called Virago right in the middle of it. They ask her to write memoirs. They ask her to write about the last thing I think she does is the, mem is the biography of Magnus Hirschfeld. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, it's partly that she, I mean, entirely to this elderly woman's credit, she falls into and is taken up by uh, a generation of young, mainly women in 1970s North London. You know, they all probably live within a block of one another and she's celebrated by them. And there's interviews and there's radio programs. And, and um, I suspect that with that kind of backing and interest, that's where those that last suite of um, books come from. In the same way, in some ways, you know, in the, 19, in the 1930s, she's taken up by the Surrealists and by Huxley's circle. And it's a, it's a different, you know, she's, she's circling with Virginia Woolf and Man Ray and T.S. Eliot and all those modernists. Um, and so it is, it is, it is, there aren't that many people whose lives so firmly, I mean, she's a, she's a really interesting, 20th century life because she lives in that 1920s post-World War I modernist culture of the surrealists and the modernists both in Paris and London and then she's catching that completely two three generations later she's catching that kind of London-based um, sexual liberation culture as well and not just as an antique piece you know she's there writing and reading um, with them. So this is a really, this is a really significant, interesting one-off um, 20th century life here. Yes, Hagit, please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask about the colonial and imperial context because we keep moving between London, Paris and maybe Berlin. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if her ideas or the knowledge she developed penetrated the colonies and used to explain the indigenous or native mind uh, during these years. Uh, yes, it did. And so, um, but you can do that very easily from your armchair in London, Berlin, and, um, you know, anywhere else in Europe and not have to go anywhere. So she, you know, so it's more characteristic of as I'm sure you know, of these knowers to write Indigenous people of the world into these um, expertise on Down syndrome, for example, is, is absolutely thoroughly perfused with ideas of race from the, 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 the term Mongolian or Mongoloid uh, in the first instance all, all the way through. Um, uh, and so it's there in... It's there not by virtue of people going places, it's there by virtue of comparative anthropology and physical anthropology uh, and, and studies of human difference. That sits, you know, and we know this, I mean, it sits absolutely squarely in Thomas Henry Huxley's work, comparative, phys, comparative um, anatomy is comparative between humans and other animals and it's comparative between species of all animals and between and amongst um, humans. That's what comparative 
anatomy was from the beginning right through the 20th century. Uh, and so, you know, race-based, racist, colonial imperial ideas are as thoroughly within this actually as, as gender is, um, uh, you know, if in, in, in different orders. And it's probably most, um, you know, so if I can cast away from Charlotte Wolfe for the moment and talk about Catherine St. Hill, that strange kind of school mom, um, educator and examiner of palmists <laughs> in 1890s London. She, a lot of her work uh, will take issue with, um, already there was palmistry law, L-O-R-E, that would say a certain line is evident in quote unquote Eskimos, but not in Bushmen of South Africa, but is in Hindus. And she, in her book, there's chapter after chapter proving or disproving that according to her own data. And so that it's fairly conventional in this, you know, the, these are the generations for whom, when, you know, differentiating between, oh, you know, well, a racial, to put it bluntly, a, ra a racialized biology is standard fare. And it finds its way into this kind of, this version of reading human bodies as it does in most of the others. Probably most crudely, um, I would say, in the studies of Down syndrome and the simian line. And that's when there's a long, there's a long standing uh, obnoxious uh, line of inquiry in early Down syndrome studies about which about um, an, um, about an I come up with a really really strange uh, claims about evolutionary biology of humans, and that there's a kind of an atavistic, essentially kind of throwback idea amongst the Mongolians that the Down syndromes. Uh, children and adults of Europe are also kind of evolutionary throwbacks in the same way. So it's completely put inside um, uh, that, you know, classic 19th century um, tradition. And that flows through and is undone, you know, over the 1920s. Um, and as I'm speaking, I, I'm going to resist, but I really want to reach behind me because I just have a bookshelves of you know, studies of ter these terrible, terrible books with names like Mongol in our midst. And these, these are the studies of Down syndrome, where once they cotton onto the simian line idea and that that is, that is a means by which Down syndrome can be uh, diagnosed in neonates and later, it, it just throws back into those deeply uh, race-based um, um, uh, means of spuriously classifying uh, classifying humans. But she doesn't go anywhere, you know. She's utterly European <laughs> and doesn't need, doesn't need to go anywhere. That's, that nobody needs to go anywhere. They just need to do what I would do, which is reach up and pick down another book about the fingerprints of Eskimos and then reach up and get another book about, you know, uh, uh, the, the craniology of, of Hindus, you know, that's where the, the spew, you know, obviously entirely spurious knowledge just comes from bookshelves, does not from going anywhere. Thank you very, very much. Um, our time is up and I want to, um, to thank you again for a wonderful stimulating um, talk and uh, conversation. And um, please, everyone, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Bashford um, for being here with us today. Thank you. And, and I, I shall follow up. <laughs> and I want to thank again uh, the Dan David Prize and Foundation um, for making this possible. And again, thank you for Professor Bashford um, because this is just the first event out of two this week. So um, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much and have 
and wonderful day and evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night.